Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. There's no definition of fragility. Okay, there's no definition of risk. Risk is very hard to uh, pin down, has never really been defined properly. And, and then I realized that what they call black swan events are not predictable, we don't understand them, but we understand very well that should an event happen, what, will, what you'll do, you see? For example, if you have Fukushima and then you have this event, then you can predict very easily conditional on an event happening, what the results would be. So that should you have a very uh, large deviation or, or a big event, you know the worst case scenario. So we're shifting from predictive methods to uh, uh, the assessment of your, the effect of something, your exposure. In other words, are you fragile or are you robust to some classes of exposures? From this, you have a perfect definition of fragility, which is that harm is not linear to the size of stone. So if I jump from 100 meters to the floor, I get harm. Visibly, you get no speaker, no second edition of the black, third edition of the black swan, stuff like that. But if I jump a million times from one nano, whatever, uh, unit, okay, i not harmed. You see, so there's not linearity. It means every incremental meter hurts me more. If I drive a car against a wall at 100 miles per hour, definitely no speaker. If I drive the same car a thousand times at a tenth of a mile per hour, you still have your speaker, you see? So therefore, you have non-linearities. And that's the definition of fragility, that based on that, we can do a lot of things. We can explain why, when you have non-linearities, as you see here, large deviation, harm from black swan, you see the linear in red and the non-linear in the curve. Large deviations affect you a lot more, where small deviation is about even. But uh -huh. now it means that we can measure fragility in terms of this convexity, concavity, actually, this nonlinearity. When you have a convex shape, for a given movement in a variable, a certain deviation in a variable brings more pain than gain when you're concave. If you're convex, you get more gain than pain. Simple, no? So we can build everything in terms of asymmetries. If you have more upside than downside, then you benefit from uncertainty, very simple. More downside than upside, you lose from uncertainty. This is traffic, why traffic is concave to number of cars. You see, if you have a, uh, say 90,000 cars in, in, in a certain city, uh, no traffic jam, 80, you add more cars, no traffic jam, then boom, traffic jam doubles. Okay, the biggest bullshit in history is that notion of the economy is a scale. It doesn't show in the numbers. Companies merge, they're visibly bigger. You see the benefits immediately, what they, this nonsense called synergy, but it doesn't show in the numbers. Few and firms don't survive. And when they're bigger, after the merger, there are no benefits. Why? Because something is lost somewhere. I'm gonna give you a very simple example of where that takes place. Why adverse events hurt you more? You see the picture of this gentleman? He's a Frenchman called Kervial. He still has lost four billion euros as a rogue trader, but in fact, what happened is he was hiding $50 billion as risk. That was, you know, you have an adverse effect, you have your trader hiding $50 billion. And he had not lost money until then, or very little. What happened is that 50 billion euros cost 4 billion to liquidate. Had you had 10 traders, we call them micro Kervial. Okay, still a nice name, not, you know. With, and then you, instead of having a big bank, like Societe Generale, you have micro Societe Generale. The cost of liquidating 5 billion, 10 times, would have been a lot less than, in total, than 4 billion. And this is why, this is the curve, the cost of liquidating small amounts is here. 10 times this here is less than one time this. You see, so you have concavity. So I'm defining everything in terms of concavity or convexity. Very simple, when you're convex, the gains are smaller than the pains. And here, pain is bigger than gain, all right? That's it, very simple. One of the perennial
questions we, we yeah. talk about, and when we first met, we, we were talking to you about this, was the, the application of your thinking, particularly sort of popularized with regard to uh, the financial services, too big to fail, and, and so on, the, the fragilizing effect of size, which you elucidate in your, in your graphs here. I think there's a degree of, um, sort of domain thinking. We, sort of, we might buy that when it comes to the financial services sector, but not so much in other fields. What do you think, Nassim, about the way in which, uh, so you take the UK, it's, a, it's still a very centralized state. Yeah, um, okay. Our public services are still largely sort of monolithically sort of administered. Uh, is, is, that, is that something you think your insights might? I mean, I uh, don't think in terms of political system. Fragility isn't determined so much by whether it's top down or, or bottom up as much as the size of the unit. You see, because you can have a tyrannical household. You see, like, you know, grandmother, tyrannical grandmother. You get the idea. Mm. So this is the first thing about decentralization. There's a second effect to show how scaling works. People, if you double the size of a village, you make the interactions between individuals vastly more complicated. And, and you know that you no longer have uh, the, the same biological reactions to your decision making. And, and let me explain. Some uh, uh, person in Washington uh, making a project, uh, of course, will chronically make mis uh, have mistakes, but they don't get feedback because they don't have any uh, uh, physical contact with the people, with their victims, you see, a bureaucrat in Washington. Whereas if you're running a small village, you run, you spend people's money, you run into them Sunday at church, and they make eye contact with you, they make you ashamed of your mistake if you've overspent. So there's a lot more, there's this natural shame and as a biological check that operates at the municipal level or a small level that doesn't at the large level. You, you, you talk as well about the way in which uh, co complexity within systems uh, increases exponentially. So that you can end up having sort of cascade effects. Yes. That, that really cuts counter to something, say, government yeah. procurement. When it comes to IT procurement, procurement generally, is that economies of scale are always never present. Let's uh, consolidate these contracts, aggregate size, and we'll save money that way. You suggest that... This, this may be fragilizing, so this may lead to problems. Yeah, what happens is that uh, we know now from computer projects that they scale, the error scales faster than size. As you saw here, I mean, if you look at this graph of black swan effects, the unpredictable cost you a lot more here, okay, because you have scaling that's nonlinear. This is a fundamental nonlinearity that exists in systems, and naively you think that by having a larger IT, you're going to but you're going to do better because, of course, you're going to have a lower unit cost. But the mistakes are costlier and costlier. Uh, you just have to read, uh, look at history. Companies, large companies, commit suicide. Okay, why do they commit suicide? Th this, this is, a, a, you know, it's obvious in things. So same with IT projects. The gentleman at uh, Oxford, uh, Ben Flagberg, figured out that complexity, you know, now is making projects uh, harder and harder to predict, and visibly. IT projects are the central uh, problem because these are the ones that scale, uh, uh, you know, scale down the world uh, the most. Mm. So I agree. I mean, having centralized IT seems nice on paper, but errors percolate very quickly, and 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 then you're going to have problems. There are some systems that are, uh, you know, that are bounded one way, become convex, and injecting uncertainty in that system increases the expected arrival time. This is a property of the system. So this is why delays, a project that's going to be three months, can last seven months, can have four, four months, uh, you know, can take four months longer, but it's never going to be five months shorter, you see. Mm -hmm. So the errors accumulate one way. So increasing uncertainty and underestimation of uncertainty implies necessarily underestimation of completion time and deficit costs, which explains government deficit. Have you known a government? That, uh, that, I mean, it's very rare in the history to see a government overestimate, okay? Usually they get it the other way. They always, always, always think they're going to get surplus or something like that in five years and never get it. Because of that reason, because projects are certainty, makes projects more costly and take longer. Do you think that Rohan should go back and tell uh, the Prime Minister that he really needs to smash up Tesco before sooner or later Tesco 
collapses and no, leaves okay. us all with no food. Let's think about it. You have the illusion of getting uh, a cheaper food now. Think of if Tesco goes bankrupt. Eventually it will. I mean, all companies go bankrupt. It's not like I'm predicting that Tesco. Eventually, when it's going to have a problem, what, how much you're going to have to pay back? But aside from other uh, factors, it's that when a company becomes powerful, then it starts convincing the public that it's working the public good. You see, and they're employing a lot of people. The government will bail them out. S assume that Tesco had a financial problem tomorrow. You'd be forced to bail them out. But have you ever heard of a national government bailing out a restaurant? No. Okay, small units are not bailed out. So it's a small guy gets a short shrift in the long run compared to the big guy. So I'm saying is that you think that you're buying the groceries cheaper now. Are you really, you know, you will, uh, it may work, okay, but the end of, you can only estimate the cost of how much you're paying when you have to add your tax money in the long run. And in, in, in if you, there's a, a problem and bail and other social disruption that you're paying for coming from Tesco. So this is a problem for you though, isn't it? Because you're, you're pretty skeptical about the state and the state's capacity to regulate effectively, but yet it sounds like you want a stronger role for the state in breaking no, no, up I, big okay, power. That, that, okay, no, I have, I, I, the state is needed for some purpose, uh, and, and, and I keep explaining. Uh, libertarians think that the markets are smart, and uh, uh, the, the, the other guys think that the markets are stupid, but government officials are, 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 are smart, okay, and I think both are silly. And particularly markets that are not natural environment, okay, we don't live natural markets, it's, uh, you know, in, the, in this age, modern, modernity has created a very uh, uh, weird setup, so you don't have uh, natural dealing, it's all done by computers. And, and of course it generates some kind of cascades we didn't have before. So, but the government, what's the role of the government? There are two things based on convexity effects, speed. You know that there have been experiments about um, traffic, Okay, if you have a nanny state telling you drive here, stop here, stop there, you're going to have more accidents. And there's an experiment done in the Netherlands by libertarians cite the experiment in the lead Netherlands, which is a great experiment, and we figured out from it that traffic signals actually uh, uh, worsen, uh, make, uh, cause more accidents. And we know that more people die jaywalking, uh, less fewer people die jaywalking than people die on, 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 on uh, crossing on regular uh, street. But the other thing that libertarian using this argument don't realize that you, speed is dangerous. So instead of wasting time regulating traffic, you should regulate speed. And it's mostly an interdict. You cannot drive faster than 42.6 miles in this zone. That's it, period. Thanks, bye. You see, so government should be there to protect us from things that are not natural, that don't have a natural. A, a, a uh, organic way of fixing themselves. Anyone talking about growth it doesn't know what growth means, right? Be because if you just talk about raw growth or we want growth, we want growth, you don't understand that it's exactly like Madoff. You want perfect growth? Madoff. <laughs> That's, I mean, is that the kind of thing you want? So people have this uh, problem with risk management. They think that it's two separable items. You, you have this growth and then you have the risk. They don't understand that to, to first, uh, you know, to get rich, you have to first survive. People don't understand this logical uh, precedence of one over the other, you see. So, and, and they, they miss it. So if you start formalizing it this way, the notion of growth is complete nonsense. You have to use a, a just growth by something. Sustainability doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a word, right? I don't understand sustainability. It doesn't have, I can't map it on a graph. But you can understand perfectly fragility-based. Is, is it fragile or not, you see? To give you an example, I have two brothers involved in the same line of business. One cuts corners like BP, makes $4 a share. The other makes $2 a share. Some analyst at some, uh, some schmuck analyst working, say, for the city would say, oh, this guy making $4 a share is a good buy. But this guy will never make it, you know, probably past a decade. So you lose back everything, you see? Mm -hmm. Whereas the one who has $2 a share and is robust will make it. So you can analyze the two using one metric, you see. So you, it, it, as a matter of fact, you can no longer talk about the $4 a share. You know he's going to go bankrupt. You can not talk about Madoff as gross. You say Madoff is zero, okay? So to me, anything that's not robust is zero. Doesn't count, doesn't exist. We shouldn't be talking about it. You see, these measures should completely rule it out, not even discount it. Now, now there's one thing I did. I said we we're going to talk about fragility or anti-fragility. Okay, anti-fragility is the exact opposite of fragility. 
If you only ask people what's the opposite of fragile, they say, well, it's robustness. It's not, because the opposite of negatively convex, conca convex is concave, you see? So they don't get the point that uh, the opposite of one is, the other one would be flat. So anything organic benefits and needs randomness. And that's not in the public psyche, you see? Uh, let me explain what do I mean by, by something organic. Has any one of you heard of something called the health club? Okay, now what do you go to the health club for? You subject your body to stress because it will get stronger, no? Okay. So people can understand it there, they can understand uh, uh, antibiotic resistance, that if you, give, you, you ingest antibiotics and you don't need them, the, 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 the germs get stronger, right? So not only it needs, it, it likes, uh, it, it needs disorder, some amount of disorder to survive. So what happened is I have this graph here that applies across anything organic. Up the top, you have a natural system that has fluctuations. And at the bottom, if you constrain the fluctuation, you end up with big cascades and jumps. So I use that for political system. Say uh, Egypt, you had some dictator, whatever it is, 40 years. No, it was, it was like here. So an anti-fragile thing, because when you deprive your body of, of uh, food for 24 hours, you have, um, you have, you know, you eliminate cancer cells. So you need stressors, things need stressors. So there are a lot of models of these, forest fires, anything, that anything organic and complex. Hence, now we have two kind of uh, systems. One, the organic, like you, for example, if I, you and I had a fight, you, both of us will end up stronger. Right? No, but both of us get stronger. You say, if someone beats on me, not too much, up to a point, I get stronger, no? But if you beat on this table, will it get stronger? No, so therefore the organic, has atrophy, use it or lose it, needs some amount of stress. And the other one doesn't want stress. So the whole thing, the economists think that the economy is like uh, something non-organic. And, and, mm. and, and, and other people, it's not formalized that way, it's organic. One of the uh, most profound uh, uh, sort of insights from your work, something you say again and again, is that human thought is itself fragilizing that the, uh, the, the limits to our knowledge mean that um, you know, human, human thought, human action causes fragility. I just, I just wonder if you could... Yes, sort of, exactly. Sort of uh, let me explain. With. Let me explain it in terms of nature. You've heard of Mother Nature, right? It's, it doesn't have... Does it have in office a prediction? No. It works by itself without prediction. It's organic and, and it works by itself. Why, how does it work without prediction? It builds things that are robust because robustness is the opposite of a predictive system. When you have that, you have to be very precise in the way you, uh, uh, you, know, you, you see the future. When you have redundancies and, and you have some kind of built, you don't really care. So when you have two kidneys, you don't really care what's going to make you lose a second kidney. You just have a second one. If you have cash in the bank, you don't want to predict whether uh, uh, you're going to lose your cash because you're going to have a recession, a war with France, or Martians invading. You don't have to consider it. You have the ca you see, get the idea? So this is the, the opposite between two systems. Now what happened is that we humans, the more intellectual we are, the more we think, and the more we build things that are fragile, because they depend so much on our projection of the future. It's called representational fragility. You see, you change the, 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 the so they depend on theories and stuff. Whereas things that are robust, they don't need theories. Now research, it turned out that the more theories we have, the less research discoveries we made. So ignorance is beneficial. When you trial and error, you have small cost to pay, it's convex, big payoff. Whereas if you're designing a system, okay, it has more downside than upside. So I'm translating everything in terms of this asymmetry, more upside than downside, or who owns the option. And even ethics are translated in these terms when someone owns the upside and we taxpayers are stuck with the downside. Okay, so it, it, it turned out also, there's some empirical evidence we can show a lot of things that anything done top down is fragile, it's concave. Anything bottom up that takes place organically is convex and likes uncertainty as a system.